So I'm Tim Panton and I'm a senior engineer at Voxeo Labs and I'm, this is a talk I gave at um, Illinois Institute for Technology on um, WebRTC, so that's the real-time communications um, of the future, I think. So I want to talk about the user-centricness of that um, and I'm Steely Glint on Twitter. So I think that the TLDR, the too long didn't read of this entire talk is that the web it, the web RTC isn't just a phone box dumped on the web, um, yeah, and you know that's the takeaway message. And I I tend to look at this with the sort of um, T. S. Eliot in mind uh, in his his poem, in which he's saying the journey of the Magi, in which he's saying that he's seen birth and death, and he thought that they were different, and actually implying that they're not, that they overlap. Um, this is a new beginning. It, it's an end of some things and it's a, a new phase for other things. Um, so wh what do I mean by that? What, what, what can we actually do with it? I'm assuming that you've kind of been to the technical talks on WebRTC, so I'm just going to talk about the philosophy and the use cases of it rather than the technology per se. So... I think WebRTC is in a position to let us rethink the call. Um, you know, telephony is number-centric. It's billing-centric. The whole of telephony has evolved around um, these things and not really around the user. I mean, so who remembers their boss or their spouse's phone number? I don't think many of us do. I think it's embedded in our contacts addresses. Maybe we have two or three phone numbers we remember, but the bulk of them are the numbers aren't relevant anymore. And who welcomes an unexpected call? Who, who wants to be rung up and told, you know, their Windows system has a virus by somebody who's trying to prank call them? Um, you know, who wants to be billed by the minute? Who wants that eager sense that money is burning whilst they're on the phone? Um, that, that's not, you know, those aren't desirable characteristics from the user point of view. So I think WebRTC gives us an opportunity to make the future more user-centric. Now, who am I to be saying this? I mean, you know, what, what right have I got to be um, pontificating about this stuff? So, my justification is that um, prior to working for, for Voxeo, working for Voxeo Labs on the Phono project and, and others, um, I ran a startup called PhoneFromHere.com, and Phone From Here was basically you take the 800 number concept and you put it onto the web. You, you use a Java applet um, to embed telephony into a website so that, you know, instead of clicking, a, um, instead of typing in an 800 number on their desk phone or on their, their, their mobile phone that they'd read off the web, they would simply click a button and be put into a phone call using the embedded microphone and speakers. So it's a pure telephony play with a pure telephony business model. I mean, people pay you know, um, a few cents a minute to receive an 800 number call, and the assumption was that they would do for this. Um, so it was a pure telephony play dumped onto the web. And, and it failed. Um, we did the uh, user analysis. We, we, we got the metrics from one of our customers. And in essence, um, well, I mean, one of the web designers said to me, I can find a better use for those pixels or your button. And the, the statistics bore him out. People actually didn't want to do it. It worked perfectly well, but people had no desire to use a phone that was dumped into the web. And when you look at that, you wonder why. And the answer is, well, you know, I hadn't obeyed any of the web models. I hadn't followed any of the way that, way that the web works, and therefore the way that people expect things to work on the web. Um, you can't buy, build by the minute on the web. Nobody has successfully done that, and, and I don't expect that we would be able to in the future. And a lot of transactions on the web are asynchronous, and that doesn't suit the traditional calling model at all well. Um, identities are very context-dependent. Who I am on the poker site is different from who I am on the um, parent governor site or on the, uh, the work site, so, or, or even to Amazon, perhaps. So... Identities are very context dependent, and what's more, it's always not always on. I mean, I may leave my phone on, but I'm going to shut this laptop in a while and, and go away, and I won't be logged into the web anywhere for uh, some hours, perhaps. 
So whilst we were failing miserably with the 800 number model um, at, at Phone From Here, we were also doing consulting and, and working on other um, projects to earn our keep. And so, several of these were significantly more successful. There are a couple of whiteboard apps, Twiddler comes to mind, where the voice was embedded into um, the whiteboard so that you, everyone who joined the whiteboard session, online web whiteboard, would be in a voice call um, and could exchange uh, could talk amongst themselves. And dating sites obviously have a use for voice. Um, we did a game as PTT with Blabalon, um, and that was great. Uh, you know, shouting advice to your posse about how to attack the orc, that kind of stuff. Um, we did some work with asynchronous conference calls, and we did some work with recruitment and taxi apps. And all of these actually did a lot better um, than, in terms of user numbers, than the core app that we were actually trying to do. So you ask yourself, why is that? Why did that you know, happen? And the answer is, is around user benefits. So the context um, is important. You know, in the taxi app and the dating and the whiteboard, we took the context of the web page and pulled it into the call so that they were associated together. You know, you knew which, in the case of the whiteboard, you knew which diagram you were all working on, so it put you all of you in that conference call that was associated with that diagram. And then there's a, a um, management of identity and, and anonymity, um, and that's very important. In fact, in almost all of the apps, that turned out to be important. That, that we knew who you were because you'd already logged into a web portal or something, or, or we knew who you wanted to be, or we knew that you didn't want to be identified. Um, say for, for dating and recruitment, the first touch of those is quite often people want to manage their anonymity quite carefully. And incidentally, the taxi app as well, that was the case. People don't necessarily want to give away their phone numbers to um, the taxi driver that they're going to deal with today. And then there's an issue about permissioning and rendezvous. So, you know, implicit in a lot of these things is that, you know, the whiteboard formed a rendezvous point that people gathered together on or, or the dating site, you know, the site was around getting the right people to talk to each other. So the rendezvous and permissioning was, was done out of the context of the call and it, the, the, the voice section of the experience was, um, was preceded by a, a rendezvous or permissioning phase. So why does, you know, what's the common theme there? And then the answer, and I borrow this shamelessly from, from Tom Howe's presentation at Ecom several years ago, is spice. So what we're saying here is that the user is, is achieving a goal. The user is um, using a website or an app to do something, to do something that they have in mind. So the target isn't to speak to somebody. The target is to find a girlfriend, is to book a taxi. It's part of another role, uh, another goal um, and not necessarily that they want to speak to somebody, they're trying to do something. Um, so part of that solution of course may involve voice, it may be the easiest way to book a taxi or tell the taxi driver where you are is to ring them up, is to speak to them. Um, but key thing is it's not a goal, it's just an added tool, it's the, as Tom says, it's the spice in the dish, it's an added flavouring. Now there are calls for which that isn't true, uh, and I call them goddess calls after an um, experience I had when I was um, running a cell network at Burning Man, um, that there are people who genuinely need to make a call now, and that a call, a phone call, a voice call is the thing that they are aiming to do. They want to speak to a loved one, or a doctor, or, you know, um, and the message is, is the important thing, and I, and I call them goddess calls because one guy was so grateful he gave me this um, brass goddess as a, a necklace um, as a as a gift having because I'd arranged a phone call for him and they typically they're emergency calls or indeed they may be hangouts with loved ones and these kinds of calls are acceptable to, at pretty much any time and they don't need the the pre-negotiation and and, and um, permissioning layers in the same way that uh, uh, many other calls do when you have negotiated calls where the negotiation may take place over a different medium, so things like IM and SMS. So you, you you arrange the call over IM or over SMS, and 
then you move it into voice once everyone's agreed that that's a good time to do that. Um, and then you have things like pre-scheduled meetings, which is essentially the same things, but the scheduling's done over some kind of scheduling system, often backed by email. And then there are calls that are so regular that they implicitly gather permission over time, um, such like you know the Sunday call home or some other, you know, the weekly conference call, where you almost don't need to pre-commission them because they are, they've kind of gathered that over time. And these are, all of these kinds of calls are acceptable because permission was asked and granted at some point. Uh, and these kinds of concepts may not translate very well to the web because the web is asynchronous. There's a final kind of call, which I call ambient calls. So these are long running. Um, we saw these statistics in, in Phone From Here that there was there were a group of people who would make very long running calls which barely had any voice in them. And, and those were people who would just dump a laptop, open a laptop, dump it on the kitchen table, and the partner um, would do the same thing in their hotel room when they were traveling. And they would join those two spaces up by sound and they wouldn't necessarily talk the whole time. It was more a feeling of being present with each other rather than necessarily talking the whole time. And these are acceptable not only because they're desired, but also because they're ambient. They, 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 they impose quite a low cognitive demand. Uh, and the synchronization is quite loose. I mean, you know, if somebody says something and you don't answer immediately, that's not a disaster in the same way as it is with a traditional phone call. Another use for these is the inter-office portals where you have a wall which simulates access to an office across somewhere else across the continent or across the world. So, I said you can't build by the minute. Um, so what can you build for? Well, these previous examples give you a hint about what you might be able to build for. Um, and basically, it's... it's you're billing for value. You're billing for whatever it is that the user perceives as the valuable thing. Um, and that might be privacy. It might be anonymity. And they're not exactly the same thing. It might be security. It might be that, you know, you know that this call is encrypted from end to end. And you, um, and you know who the, far, the, the receiving party is to a good degree of confidence. Or indeed, what maybe what their role is in within the organization. It, you might be paying for availability, you know, just for the facility of having this on your computing device. You might pay a, a, a subscription fee. Um, you might pay for recording or retention of recordings. Um, you might pay for convenience, uh, some, some factor that it arranges stuff for you, saves you time. So basically all of these things, or, or it might even pay you by results. You know, you, you, might, you might bill by... Um, by a success fee on a on a um, on a phone line. So you know, if this uh, if this job interview results in somebody being taken on, and this has been carried through your service, then you get a, a success fee and a finder's fee, in effect, for for that job um, being filled. So these are about billing for value. And, and, and honestly, that's not so different from, from the way that you bill for pretty much everything else in business. It's around the perceived value that the recipient is, is getting. So I hear a lot the idea that there's not much to do left in communication. We've pretty much solved, you know, the whole communications thing. We know what video calling looks like. We know what the phone call looks like. You know, actually, there's nothing much new to do. Um, a few little things around the edges. And that's exactly, exactly what 1905 physics looked like. So in 1905, physics was done and dusted. Newtonian physics was completely understood. It modelled, it was accepted as the definition of how physics worked. There were a couple of little edge problems that, you know, still needed tinkering away at, and people were looking at those. And solving those problems and one in particular, the photoelectric effect, revealed that there was an entire quantum universe under there that we hadn't looked at, that Newtonian physics was an acceptable approximation, but it didn't represent some kind of ultimate truth, that there was a lot more to do. And we've been working in physics, we've been working for the, the, the following 110 years, or nearly, 
um, trying to work out what quantum actually means. And we still don't know, and we're still working on it. WebRTC will open the communications universe. It will do the same thing to, to real-time communications. It will open a whole set of new vistas that we've not even thought about. So my conclusions, and such as they are, are that there's plenty of demand for, for communication. The, the, and in, to do that, to find out where that demand is, you need to use a user-centric kind of web thinking. You need to, to measure everything, get metrics for everything, to learn what's working and what isn't, work, learn what people want to do and what they don't do, want to do. Now, the good news for, for the incumbent players and for people who have a vested interest in the existing system is that WebRTC makes a really nice bridge from the old to the new. Um, and I did a demo, I won't do it on this uh, recording, but I did a demo um, showing a WebRTC call. Um, and I will, I'll show you a still of it, and I'll, I'll maybe talk around it. So this is a um, user interface we put together for testing um, the, the Phono API, which is a, an embedded uh, an API, um, jQuery API that you can uh, use to embed a, a phone in your web page. Um, and in this case, it's running a WebRTC session. Now, the interesting thing about this, leaving aside all of the, the gubbins, is that I called an IVR. Now, the IVR read me a menu back. Um, so it said press 1 for a DTMF test, 2 for landline test, 3 for wideband test, and so on. But it simultaneously sent me a message, which was displayed, as you can see in the bottom, in the chat window. It was displayed in the chat window. So I'm able to see what prompts I have just been read. And I can look back through them and think, oh, if I've forgotten, was it was the landline test two or three? I can look back at that and see what it was. It's a remarkably simple thing to do with WebRTC, but I think it's quite powerful. It illustrates that you can join the old, i.e. IVRs, up with the new, which is a screen-based system, and get some value out of that, even, um, even using the simplest kinds of technology. Um, without hugely changing the interface on either end. So um, I'd like to thank you for listening, if you have been. Um, feel free to email me questions at tpanson.voxeo.com or indeed tpanson.voxeolabs.com um, or uh, Steely Glint on Twitter. And um, I would like to, to hear your thoughts on the matter. Thank you very much. <laughs>